were the main discussions and the main challenges that you observed in higher ed during this transition of, of courses online? I, I think the underlying problem is that most faculty in most post-secondary institutions, that's colleges and universities, have no requirement and have no background in pedagogy and, and methods of teaching. And that makes it really difficult to suddenly change your main delivery method to another delivery method without having that, you know, basically they have one model of teaching, which they're familiar with, um, and that's probably got them through okay because it's what their professors did and so on, and it's what students expect. But it doesn't help when you have to suddenly make a, a rapid change like that. Um, and it's a big problem. It's not going to go away, um, even when COVID-19 goes. We've seen that uh, institutions are having to change. Uh, they, are, they were already moving more to online and blended learning before COVID-19. That's not going to go away after COVID-19. All it's done is to accelerate the process. So that problem's still going to be there. And that's what I was actually writing about in the paper was, you know, um, how do we change the uh, culture, I guess, of, an organ of, of our post-secondary systems so that teaching is valued as much as research, for instance, because without that, nothing's going to change much. Um, that's certainly true of universities. And secondly, how do we deal with part-time instructors? And that's another big challenge, particularly in the colleges, because most of the college instructors are not teachers, they're subject experts in, in their own field. Um, and they teach the way that they were taught. So uh, again, it, it's very difficult. Um, so it's not just a COVID-19 problem, it's a problem of institutional change. Exactly, and we've been talking about this change before COVID-19, and we've been talking about the whole digital transformation and the whole reviewing, you know, the education system and how we're facilitating learning in our classes. But as if the resistance was so, like, super hard, like people were not, they were comfortable with how they always done things. Mm -hmm. And now because of the COVID, as you said, it's been accelerated and they're put in a context where they have no choice but to. But the problem is that we had this, you know, like all these different technologies that emerge to the rescue, but it was a simple transfer of whatever is being done offline to yeah. online. And this is why we had a lot of students, you know, like we had the shout of, uh, they were complaining about the, the quality of education and the quality of their courses and whether it's worth it. So we had this first phase where transferring our courses just to finish the semester was a bit okay because we needed to, to, to complete the semester but the transformation that should be happening for the fall during the fall semester and for the long run uh, this is a huge challenge so when i was uh, speaking with centers they were really deter like they they were separating these different phases they said that during this first phase we were really supporting them during this transition but now it's really a big challenge to helping them and supporting them through the transformation of their courses, rethinking the design of their courses, and rethinking the, the assessment, the whole evaluation approaches. So what, how can, you know, like, what, what are your, well, your yeah, I, that? What, what, yeah. Uh, I, again, I don't think the issue is what should be done. I think the issue is scaling it up. So the teaching centers know what the, the instructors need to 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 learn to change their teaching it's just they can't reach all the instructors in the short time available at in enough depth to make a big change in what they're doing and to be fair to the instructors you know they they even though they're pivoting they've got a kind of maximum of two months three months to prepare it's still too big a change for the for you know for, for anyone to do so um, on the other hand, I, I suspect that um, some will have learned something already from their spring semester and will re realize they, they need to change. And so, you know, there's a lot of on-the-job learning going on here by the instructors themselves. And that's not necessarily a bad thing because that's more likely to stick than maybe a, sort of a somewhat academic course about how to design 
design a, an online course, for instance. So um, it, it's not an ideal situation, but it is one that might actually lead to ongoing and long-term improvements in the teaching. So I, I am opt not totally pessimistic. Um, what has surprised me and pleased me is how willing man many instructors have been to make this change and um, have really tried very hard to make it work for them and their students. And I think that that's really encouraging. And I think that's true not just in Canada too. I think it's been you know, fairly universal um, from the contacts I've had overseas on this. So yes, uh, I, I mean, it is tough, but um, it, it, is a good <laughs> it is a good learning experience, you know, having to do things, it's experiential learning, you know, we've always said that's a good way to learn. <laughs> it's just that, unfortunately, the students are going to pick up some of the mistakes, you know, <laughs> but... <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. And they're, they're, they're going through this and uh, every, everyone is learning, even the centers, as you said, they're, they know how to support uh, professors and faculty members, but in, in the time of crisis with their limited number of, of, yeah. of people, like this is, this is a huge challenge to be able to, I was speaking this morning with one of the universities and they were saying that we have 500 courses that should be online during the fall and we're a limited number of like how many people we can even hire because even the new hires they need to be trained in order to for them to be able to support these faculty members so yeah. this is again like if, even though they are trained and they have their expertise it's a huge challenge to be able to support everyone and really answer to the needs of all these different professors i think one one thing that has seen to, does seem to be working in this environment is what I call just-in-time resources so that if a faculty member wants to know how to improve an online lecture there's a, a website that the institution provides that they can go to. Now, UBC has some uh, has a very good couple of sites actually one in the arts faculty and one from the Center for Teaching and Learning about how to make good videos and, and it also has the research on which the advice is based so that if the faculty member is dubious about why they should talk for more than 20 minutes they can click on the research by Richard Meyer that shows that you know th this is you know what happens um, so I, I think increasingly and I, I think that that's an issue again that is going to face teaching and learning centers as we move more to blended learning uh, again, how do they scale up the support for faculty wanting to integrate some online learning with their face-to-face -face teaching? And again, I think the more that instructors can find a, a, a website exactly when they need it for whatever they want to do. How do I do continuous assessment, you know? Or how do I assess my students online? Do I need to change? I have a little website on that, a difference between continuous and summative assessment, the advantages and disadvantages, etc. And just have something they can go to when now unfortunately of course you want them thinking about it at the beginning of the course and they'll probably go to it at the end of it. But um, so you, it's not just either or you need both. You need uh, proper professional upfront development, but you also need to have these resources that faculty and instructors can go to. Yeah and, and some of the centers were saying that because of again, the crisis, they came up with all these different resources, but the professors, the faculty members, regardless of, of, of their status, um, they, many of them, they were eager to actually learn. As you said, they were ready and they, they wanted to find solutions, but they were overwhelmed with all these resources. Yeah. So one yes, of- I, I do know a couple of centers that have actually redesigned their websites. So it's easier for faculty to find stuff on them because they hadn't set them up so on for an on-demand service they set them up more as a marketing service you know the idea was to get faculty in the door and that's what the website was designed for and they had to change their main website the first page the faculty member went to to provide you know tips and guidelines on how to do things because that's what they were asking for um, so I, again i think that's um, I don't know how you deal with that in the long term, but in the short term, I think that's a fairly good solution to come up with uh, a changed website that actually meets the demand that instructors are coming up with.
And what they're hoping for is also the long-term transformation, right? Like whatever now is being triggered or being experimented with that would actually be supported for a more change uh, within, you know, like the, the approaches for teaching online. And one of the things that they were finding super challenging is the fact that because of the crisis, they were many communities that emerged in the faculties, within the faculties, that started exchanging practices and exchanging ideas and mm -hmm. really, you know, like helping each other. And how can they support this and make sure that this would be sustainable for after the crisis, despite the fact that we don't know when the crisis will end, right? Uh, but the whole idea of learning and really creating this community online of professors who, of faculty members who would actually share, um, this is another challenge that they are facing. Yes, yeah, so I think the whole issue of collaboration is an open, open access resources, open education resources in this area. Uh, UBC has created nine modules on putting your course online and that's open access, anybody can use them. So if, if a department, if a teaching and learning center is overrun, they don't have to develop everything themselves. They just have to direct their faculty to existing resources elsewhere, for instance. So I, I think that's one way of coping with the stress um, and, and also coping with the um, uh, n amount of demands. You know, if you've got an open access resource you can send them to, then um, that takes a little bit of pressure off you to have to provide answers for everything. Yeah, so I, I was looking at your recent post and you talked a lot of um, about the areas that we need to improve online learning. And you, Sorry, were, the, you, you talked about the areas that oh the areas have, yes. yeah that we need to improve um, that needs to be improved in, in online learning, and you were looking at schools. Where what were the areas that you find in uh, that you found in higher education that needs to be that need to be improved in online learning? Well, it's the faculty development model. It's, it, it's a broken model, or it's, it's not broken. It just never existed. Basically, I mean. It's there for about 10% of the faculty who use it, but the rest don't. Um, and it's, you know, PhD is a training and research, not in teaching. So um, it's, this is the big structural issue. And it's not just for COVID-19, it's because uh, we need to develop knowledge and skills in students, uh, particularly the skills component, and that needs a different method of teaching than content presentation. Now, I'm not saying all university teaching is content presentation, but a lot of it is. And uh, we need to change the teaching methods. And that's a big, big challenge. I mean, how do you do that on a, on a large scale, not just, you know, around the edges? And you talked a lot about um, the first year, uh, large lecture hall classrooms and how we can move them online and the yeah. whole challenge. And I've been also hearing in, in many of the meetings that I've been having um, and the centers I've been meeting with um, about not only the, the big number of students, like when you have the first year students who want the experience, um, the online, the, the, the on-campus experience. Um, so it's not only about teaching these big numbers, but also to through our online teaching, how we can make sure that they're included and they feel that they are coming to this community and being part of, of the university and their cohort and their... So what strategies or what advice or what thoughts do you have on making sure that these first year students feel that they belong? Because we don't have it. Yeah, that's a very difficult question because um, Again, I, if, we, if, if I was, I'm glad I'm not, but if I was an administrator, I, I would be looking at other ways of handling those first year classes. So I would look at smaller class. I, I, I would try, the problem is you need to go really back and look at the whole structure of the way that faculty are allocated to courses, how that's done. It's usually done by the faculty themselves in meetings um, and they, decide what they want to teach and what they don't want to teach. And usually the junior members get the rough end of the deal. You know, the junior faculty have to do, and in particular, the sessionals get the, the rough end of it. So 
it, it's really organized around the, the interests of the, 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 the senior faculty and what they want to do. Now for the first year, you know, I would say to everybody, look, this is an emergency. You know, this is an unusual year. Let's forget about our traditional way of doing things. How can we throw as much resources as possible behind the first year courses, get everybody teaching a first year course. Then we can break the numbers down and we can have some on campus, you know, and some and the rest done online. So you're, you're looking at smaller classes with a blended learning model um, rather than having them all in one large lecture theater. But that's a lot more work. And, and again, you would probably need a year to plan something like that normally to do it. You've got a lot of negotiation with instructors to get them to agree to all this. It's not so much the actual design that takes the time, it's the cultural change that takes the time. And you need a very strong head of department there who would say, you know, we're going to do things differently this year. No argument, we're going to do it. And that doesn't, that's not the way that universities work. You might get away with it in a, in, in a business, but you certainly can't get away with it in a university. So it's a cultural shift. And even though instructors are doing their best, I'm not sure they're ready for that, that cultural shift. And of course, the worry is, well, if we have, if we're successful this year, maybe we'll have to do it every year. And, uh, and I, do I really want to be teaching first year classes every year? You know, so, well, I don't know. I, I mean, I was fortunate. I went to a university where uh, at least two out of my four subject areas that I did in my first year, the first year classes were taught by the head of department, the most senior professor in the department, because basically they were recruiting. In other words, at the end of the first year, you could choose, you know, to go into history or psychology, you know. Um, and so they wanted their best, they wanted the best students to come to them. Now, we don't have, so you need that kind of incentive to change the teaching. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah. It's not. It's not nothing to do with online learning. It's to do with first year classes, um, and we could teach them very, very differently if we wanted to. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. And the the, the whole, the whole, the, the whole. App, just thinking about, and this is another thing that was being shared by by faculty members is the the amount of work that is required for teaching online. Uh, right. Yes, but with first year classes, you see, they don't have to do the lectures. Mm. See, they can save all the time on lesson preparation because that content's all out there on the internet. Just send the students to look it up. Yeah. And given the fact that every, well, it is an online issue in the sense that now first standard first year and second, even second year content is all out there and it's free and it's easily accessible. So what students need is to know, you know, what do they have to study? Um, and, and what kind of activities do they need and what kind of outcomes are they trying to get from studying this and how do they get to that? And so it, it does shift the responsibility of the professor from being the subject expert and controlling and manipulating all the subject, you know, which is what they do in a lecture. They do all the work, you know, basically all the students have to do is try to understand it and hopefully model the way that the professor does it. But Unfortunately, that's not what students need now. They, they, they need to be able to do that themselves, partly because the content base is changing rapidly. By the time they get to fourth year, there'll be lots more research papers and when they've left. So they need to know how to manage that knowledge. Um, and that they should be taught from the first year. That should be the skills they'd be taught. You know, how to find out and, and follow your own interest in this subject area and how to analyze it, how to judge the value of it and so on. And those are the things that professors should be teaching and not through lectures, but through giving students the opportunity to practice this and then give them feedback. Yeah. So they still need a high level of expertise, you know, because, you know, it's, in fact, in some ways they need to be even better at their subject area if they're going to give that kind of wide range of advice that students will, will, will ask for. But unless we retrain our faculty, that's not going to happen. You just hope that they pick it up as they go. And I, I think that has to change in the long run. If we, we, we have to find two things, mainly have something built into the PhD process so that there's some teaching inbuilt, some teaching skills um, required in, 
in the PhD. Now they may not want to go into teaching, but they, they may not want to go into research either doing a PhD. So, um, so you know, there should be something built in. Um, and again, there are a lot of structural issues. I, I actually, when I moved to UBC in, and I was asked to help the institution move to online learning, one of the first things I said was, you have to look at the PhD program. And they said, we can't do that if we require students to spend say nine months out of four years doing a teaching program they'll go to another university where they don't have to do it so and our faculty will be really upset because they're cheap labor you know and if they you know they, we want they want them as research assistants unpaid research assistants you know to do their own stuff so there's a whole kind of uh, set of systemic barriers to to, to getting uh, faculty trained before they start teaching. Yeah, so in, in this very specific context that we're going through, what would be your advice to teaching and learning centers for, for, for the full semester to be able to really, as much as they can, facilitate or support faculty members during this process, knowing that the transition could happen, but this transformation and really rethinking stuff is, is a challenge. Knowing that communication, like just to, to give you an idea about the challenges that they shared, communication was a huge challenge. Um, really making sure that having this more of a kind of personalized support is a huge challenge because of their ca ca capacity. Like they don't have enough uh, people to answer the needs of everyone. So they have to come up with strategies to be able to really support yeah. um, the whole because everyone is being move, is, is moving online. So what would be your... I, I think what I would do is I would do a good search of what's already out there. Uh, I, that, I, I mean, I'm basically saying to the Centers for Teaching and Learning, what I'm saying to the faculty is that go look look at what's there already. Don't recreate what's all already there and build a good one-stop resource that your faculty can go to. And it, there's lots of resources covering lots of questions that they make. Make it question-based. What are the questions that faculty are coming up with? And where can they go to get answers to those questions? Um, and if they can't get the answers, then contact this person in the center, you know, but that immediately sends a lot of people off to other sources and frees up that person to deal with just the stuff that's not covered and probably get really good questions then from faculty because they can't find it on, on. but you, you know, I know that there are at least the UBC course um, or nine modules and there's one for colleges from Lethbridge College um, uh, for college instructors. So, you know, there's two fairly comprehensive resources. There's my book, Teaching in a Digital Age, they can go to on specific things like what's the right mix of online and face-to-face, -face, if that's their question. Uh, you know, well, how do I decide what to put online? What should I, you know, don't just assume that everything should go face-to-face -face and if I can't get it, <laughs> I'll put it online. But, you, you know, so send them to the resources, um, but make it, question based you know what are the questions what and particularly track any questions that they ask you know if you've got a blog site where they can post questions and so on um, then answer the questions but also answer it in a way that other instructors can see the resources that you've referred them to for instance yeah so uh, in in my project in the guide i've been uh, my two research assistants are working on um, collecting all these different, all like as much as possible, um, the different pages that exist on different universities where the resources are there, the teaching, center, teaching and learning centers are sharing these resources, whether for faculty members or for, for students. And we're trying to put all of mm -hmm. this in, in one appendix where these centers could have access to this, but also faculty members could actually have um, an idea about what is being shared and what are the different resources. But it is a challenge, especially when you, you have so much information yeah. um, out there. So it's really being able to concentrate on, on the needs of these professors and making sure that you're giving them exactly yeah, I, what they I need. think that you asked the question earlier on, you know, what should I do to prepare, you know, what should they do, the centers to prepare them for September? 
Well, I, I think, yes, by all means have those resources available on demand for the faculty so they can find them easily. But they'd also need a framework in which to place all these questions, you know, and I would try to spend a little bit of time about talking about uh, how students learn online, you know, quality issues in online learning, have that kind of framework and may, m maybe your own little course on that or not even a course, but, you know, um, maybe even a, a Zoom workshop or something where, where you, 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 prov you provide the big picture and how all these bits fit in. And that's where you'd look at different teaching methods, for instance, um, and how they convert to online learning or teaching methods developed like collaborative online collaborative learning, for instance. So if you're really interested in this, there's quite a lot of research in this area. And if you want to follow this up, this, this, this is what it is. But that needs to be put in a framework of all the things that uh, online learning does well and what it doesn't do well. Uh, an opportunity for faculty to see the big picture, not just all these, how do I do a video? How do I do this? How do I, uh, can I ask these questions on a learning management system and so on, you know? Can you step back from that and say, well, yes, but here's the bigger picture. How do you want to teach your students? Um, should you be using this as an opportunity to rethink your learning outcomes, for instance, so that they're more aligned with what students need these days? So like critical thinking, how, how are you assessing critical thinking? I mean, how, 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 you, you know, how, are you, how are you building the teaching of critical thinking into your course? Um, and there's lots of good answers to that, but often it's kind of assumed that students are developing critical thinking, for instance, um, rather than it's explicitly taught. How do I build on what they've already got when they come in and how can I tell the next, the, when they go on to the next course, you know, how, how can I say where they are in their critical thinking so they, they can build on it, for instance. So I think it's getting that bigger picture that's probably needed for, for, for September, but it's probably too late now. It should have been done maybe a month ago. But um, yeah. if they haven't got one, what I think they need is to really push the institution for a digital learning strategy for the institution uh, to get each department to look at where it wants to be in four years time and its mix of online and face-to-face -face teaching. Uh, are there specific areas like virtual reality that would really need to be developed in, in their subject area? You, you know, each department really needs a, a, a plan for their teaching over the next few years and how online learning is going to fit into that teaching. Yeah. Um, so that you, for instance, you know, I, where do you want to, do you want all courses to be, have an online version as well as a face-to-face -face version? Do you want, or do you want to focus specifically on graduate courses? Is that the most appropriate area for you? Um, and if so, how would you get there? What, what do you need to do to get there in, over the next three or four years? Uh, now I know about a third, two thirds of Canadian universities and colleges either have a plan or are developing one, but now is the time to really nail it down and, and get it bought into and some resources put behind it by the institution. It, 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 this is an opportunity to be grabbed by the teaching and learning centers if they want to go in that direction. If I did, I would focus on the scaling issue. How do you scale up when all your courses are going to have an online component or most of them are going to have it? Um, how are you going to scale up the level of support to all the faculty and I don't have good answers for that but I think it's it's a question they need to think about yeah sure hire as many people as you can now but the danger is if a teaching and learning center gets too big that money comes out of the provost budget and the faculty say well we could we'd be better off having more teachers you know <laughs> than, than having the money spent on this very large center that that's happened to me in the past so I've been in a center that got too big and, and, and they chopped us down, you know? Um, so I think knowing how to scale up without um, in, over, over increasing the size of your, it's always gonna be, you know, something like, I don't know, 5% uh, of the overall teaching budget is, is, is not, you know, it's gonna go into the teachers, te Center for Teaching and Learning. So there is a limit to how far you can expand the numbers. So then it becomes, how do we scale up? And I think you have to walk the talk, you know, you have to use technology as much as possible to scale up. Um, 
provide lots of resources that people can go to, uh, send them off to open education resources elsewhere and build the gap, fill the gaps yourself, you know, that fit the areas that you know there's, there's a lot of demand for and you can't find anything out there that's suitable. Thank you so much for your time. No, it's my pleasure.